good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody tonight. Let's turn to Titus and chapter 2. Titus in chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse 11. I want us to think about the theme tonight of being sanctified by grace. Sanctified by grace. In our text, we Titus chapter 2, and we'll read verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works zealous for good works you know I think if we look around our landscape you might not meet too many people who profess to be Christians who are really zealous for good works In fact, I think we live in a culture where there is an ocean, really, of you know, nominal Christianity, Christianity in name only, Christianity by association, not by regeneration, but association, by family ties, the church of parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, historic ties as Southerners. Paul's word here is really a dynamic contrast to what we see in nominal Christianity. I think about all the cliches that we probably have all heard before, right? I love Jesus, but I hate religion. What's that even mean? Sometimes what that really means is I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want any accountability. I don't want any of those people out there calling me to repentance. Or I love Jesus, but I, I don't like the church or I hate the church, really. Since Jesus is the head of the church, Jesus died to purchase his church, you hate the church. You despise the bride, maybe you despise the groom. Nominal Christianity really is the ocean that we're surrounded by. We want to be, by God's grace and power, uh, an island in that ocean. I suppose that nominalism has always existed in different forms. In fact, when you read throughout church history, you see that there have always been seasons and movements of idleness and um, even perversion in the visible church. In our own nation, we have 150 years of revivalism, right? Decisionism. Sign this card, shake this hand, nod your head, repeat this prayer, you pray that prayer. We believe, brother, you're saved. Placing human action and associating that with regeneration. Ignoring John's words that we read only a few weeks ago, I think, from John chapter 1, that we're not born of human will. It's an ocean of nominalism. And oftentimes there's very little difference between those who profess this nominalism, profess this version of religion without power, decision without regeneration. It's not very much different between those who profess that form of Christianity from those who have no claim of Christ at all. In fact, oftentimes it's just the very same thing. It's just been baptized. And it knows a little bit more Christianese. You know, it's very common actually to hear that people speak about receiving salvation without any 
any change at all. No, no repentance, no, no ongoing sanctification, no change of heart, no change of action, no change of morality. And sadly, it appears that the biblical truth of you know, salvation as a gift of God with transforming power is far too often lost. It seems that far too often the Spirit of God is minimalized as the work of man is maximized. We forget that every true believer has been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And of course we say that and we all know ourselves, we know our own hearts, we, we know our own sin and our own failure. We know that we still sin, we know we still fall short. We remember the Apostle John's warning in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. We make God a liar. So we recognize that we too, as believers, we, we sin, but there is by God's grace and power a transformation. We are saved by amazing grace and we are sanctified by the same amazing grace. We see this in verses 11 and 12, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This appearing to all men is not some you know, universal salvation. It is speaking about our Lord's incarnation, revealing himself as one full of grace and truth as we have seen in John's gospel. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, in this present age. And so what the Apostle Paul is affirming and what we are affirming is that the grace that saves is the grace that sanctifies. The grace that brought us to justification is the grace that is bringing us sanctification. He is changing us. He is transforming us. So we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and we are sanctified by that same grace. So Paul is, is telling Timothy, don't divorce saving grace from sanctifying grace. Don't divorce them. I mean, what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. The same spirit and the same power source is at work in both our justification and our sanctification. The grace that saves us from our sins it's the grace in verse 12 that is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. It's teaching us. We have the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. He lives in us. We had former schoolmasters. We had the world, the flesh, and the devil. It got in our thoughts and our affections and the course of our life. But now, as those who belong to Him, we are under the schoolmaster of God's Spirit. Again, brethren, this is a direct refutation from the ocean tide of nominalism. Jesus is a get out of hell free card, and quite frankly, oftentimes just a open license to sin without any degree of remorse. After all, I know no matter what I'll do, I will go to heaven one day, they wrongly suppose. Wrongly because the regenerate heart does not want to live in open rebellion to the God that saves them. The regenerate heart desires the things of God. So again, Paul is teaching that the grace that justifies the believer and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is also the Spirit of God, the grace of God that trains us in holiness. 
Now see that he does this in, in two ways, or at least two ways that we'll focus on this evening. First, saving grace trains believers, true believers, to deny or turn away from or renounce ungodliness. Again, it's not that true believers cannot fall into temptation and fall into sin in patterns of ungodliness, but we don't like the mud. And when we fall in, we desire to get out. In fact, as someone who's been in pastoral ministry for a while, I've met lots of people along the narrow way who they've fallen back into some old pattern of sin, something they did before they were Christians. And now they hate it. The sin they used to love and treasure, the mud puddle they used to wallow in when they were still in their swinish sins, they now hate. And they want out. And they want to be cleansed. And they want to walk in the newness of life. And so saving grace trains Christians to deny ungodliness. Now, this happens because, again, positionally, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things become new. And that plays out practically in that Christians are desiring, training, to become what we already really are. And there is no peace with sin as a believer. We're not signing any treaty deals with our old self. We're, na we're not making any peace with that old terrorist called sin. There is in us a sense of I'm not going back because God's Spirit has done something decisive in us that we could never, ever, 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 ever do on our own. But secondly, saving grace reorients a true Christian's desires. Paul here describes the kind of life that a Christian learns to live, is growing to live, is being taught, verse 12, teaching us to live. First, Paul says that a believer in Christ is trained in self-control. Teaching us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. There is, within the true believer, a desire to deny ungodliness. Deny. That plays out in self-control. It is a fruit of the Spirit, it is something that the Spirit of God is doing in His people. It is a mark that we are His. It also, though, involves discipline, doesn't it? And restraint. Again, if I can kind of piggyback off our teaching last week, we should never find ourselves saying, I'm going to let go and let God. We are not passive in our sanctification. But we are active. We are cooperating with God's Spirit in every believer to put to death our sin. And so this does involve discipline and restraint. And that's because we realize that sin does remain in us, but it does not reign over us. Think about that, brethren. Sin does remain in us. Sin does not reign over us. It's not calling the shots. It's not in charge. It's not in the control seat of your life because you have the Spirit of the living God indwelling you. So grace trains us to, over time, grow and learn to control ourselves. A believer in Christ is trained in self-control. Secondly, grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Paul here is, is um, he's showing us not just what to avoid. In fact, Paul has no laundry list of behaviors to avoid here, so much as 
what to pursue. We are to pursue Christ's likeness, who displayed perfectly and without blemish a life of righteousness and godliness, being God in flesh. So Paul here is showing us what to pursue. Pursue Christ. Pursue godliness. Third, Christians are motivated by the glory of Christ. So the fuel source, you might say, is a spirit of the living God who indwells every believer. And the motivation is, the motivation is the glory of Christ. First, we see in verse 13, his glorious return. He just sang a song about his return. And this was the text for that song, if you notice that. Verse 13 looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So every true believer is longing for the return of King Jesus. With that we say, Maranatha, Lord, quickly come. We're motivated by his glorious return. The second of all, in verse 14, we see his purpose in redemption. looking for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Praise be to God. That our Savior Jesus, both in his life and his death, gave himself for us. Coming to the earth that he made, living a perfect, righteous life, never sinning, doing what the first Adam could not, would not do, and then dying in the place instead of sinners and redeeming us, purchasing us out of the slave market of sin. We were slaves. Our blessed Savior Jesus purchased us by his own blood. He redeemed us from every lawless deed so that the people of God stand justified and there'll be no condemnation, no condemnation. But that's only half of the statement. And redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So, brethren, the grace of God can be seen in the, in the fact that our Lord purchased his people from their sins and that he teaches us to turn away from sin as we follow our Lord Jesus by faith. So, brethren, as we think about these things, be reminded that grace is free. You did nothing in the first half of verse 14. You did nothing to cause our Lord Jesus to redeem you from your sins. But in the second half of verse 14, we are called by the Spirit of God who teaches us the denying ungodliness and the worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We are to purify. He is purifying for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So be reminded that, yes, our grace, our salvation is free. But grace is not cheap. We were purchased by the blood of our Savior Jesus. He purchased us as a special people. And therefore, brethren, I would call all of us tonight to pay special attention to our own lives and to be a people who are zealous for good works. Good works as the Bible defines good works. Not good works as our country or culture defines good works. Whatever that is. As the Word of God would tell us. Be a people who are serious about the things of God. To be a people of prayer to be a people of devotion, a people who look out for each other's best interest and carry each other's burdens and pray for each other. So let us then, brethren, as recipients of saving grace, pursue holiness, pursue holiness, pursue godliness, deny ungodliness and worldly lust, seek by God's grace and power to live soberly, righteously, and godly 
in this present age. We all need help for that. We can't do it alone. We have the Spirit of God who indwells us. We have the church that walks alongside of us. And so let us, even this night, lock arms together. God did not call you to live in isolation. You know this because you're here on a Wednesday night. You came to pray. You came to hear a devotion. You're here because you know you need other people. So let us tonight cut it together that we will strengthen each other by God's grace and power as we mutually seek to be zealous for good works. Our Father, we pray your grace. Tonight we confess a great need for you. We know our own hearts. We know our own sins. We know our own weaknesses. Lord, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God who purchased us by his own blood, who did for us what we can never do for ourselves. We could not save ourselves. We can't rescue ourselves. We can't redeem ourselves. So we look to you. And we ask, Spirit of the living God, you would help us in our weakness. Lord, we earnestly desire to be a people, a special people, zealous for good works. And so we pray, Spirit of the living God, that you would fill us, that you would use us. We pray, Lord, that as we hear the word of God read and preached week in and week out, help us, Lord, to take hold of these means of grace be the further conformed into the image of Jesus. And we ask these things in our Savior Jesus' name. Amen.